Hello, heathens. I'm Megan Angus, and this is Spinning the Wheel Podcast. In this weekly audio ritual, we explore the eight seasons of the Witch's Wheel of the Year, and we discover how it is so much more than eight Sabbaths. We weirding witches time travel through holy days, festivals, and celestial events connecting our celebrations and magic to the past, present, and future. Our cackling fills the night as we take our turn gathering the wool, wielding the distaff, and spinning the wheel. And welcome back to another episode of Spinning the Wheel Podcast with me, your solar witch, Megan Angus. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. Um, Welcome to summer solstice and summer season. This is our first podcast of uh, summer of 2023. Um, So here we go. Okay. (laughs) Freaking cool, man. Um, you know, we've got a little preamble and then we've got a lot of stuff going on this week. Surprise, surprise. Right. Um, but we are, uh, we are crossing a threshold as I talked about, uh, two weeks ago in the last audio podcast, as I talked about last week in the, um, Litha class, the summer solstice class, we are crossing a threshold. We have officially left spring behind. And we have officially stepped into summer. Um, But before we get into all of that, let me say this. Um, What? Okay. (laughs) I know what I'm doing. I've I've done this before. (laughs) Um, Okay. Uh, (laughs) Let's start with the preamble like we usually do. Uh, what is our next class? Our next class is June 27th. This is a tarot circle. Uh, tarot circle is an exclusive benefit for my patrons, but this is a free workshop that I host just about every month for all of my patrons, regardless of what level you are subbed at. So you can sub at a dollar and join us for tarot circle. Uh, and get all the other stuff that you get with a buck. Um, this month, we are going to be looking at fire in the tarot. Um, we are going to be looking at the suit of wands. We're going to be looking at all of the cards in the major arcana that are connected with the element of fire. We're going to be looking for symbols of fire throughout the tarot deck. And uh, we will also be conducting a group reading for Litha season. Um, I will most likely be utilizing a Smithwaite deck in class. Please feel free to bring whatever deck, uh, you would like to work with. Um, this class is free exclusive for all patrons, as I already mentioned. And, uh, this class will be recorded, uploaded, and available for folks that are subscribed at the Venus level, which is $9 a month and higher. If you cannot join us for the class itself. Okay. Uh, where are we? We are in Litha season, as I have mentioned multiple times. If you haven't, go check out the Litha class. It is available uh, here on whatever platform you are listening on uh, as an audio class. It is available on Spotify and YouTube as a video. You can also go to my website and go to the Litha page and it should be listed right at the top of the page, um, along with a bunch of other writings and classes that I have taught and collected over the years. Um, So if you are really wanting to dive deep on what the heck all are we doing with Litha and summer solstice and this threshold that we have just crossed over into summer season, I've got piles of stuff for you to, to, to work through. <laughs> we, we, we've been producing the content for some time now. <laughs> so to get us up to speed, actually, before I do that, let me say this. Thank you to my patrons who make it possible uh, for this to happen every week and for these classes to be taught and be free to the public. You guys are fucking rad. 
if you want to uh, support me in this work, subscribe to my Patreon. Um, thanks. Appreciate it dude. Uh, if you are wanting more information about who is this weird lady yelling on the internet, you can check out my website, meganagus.com. You can sign up for my newsletter there. Um, and if you are wanting to support this work, but you can't do it financially, which is very reasonable in this day and age, please share this work, uh, like it, follow me on whatever platform you're listening or watching on, uh, share it with your friends and family and leave a review, leave a comment. The robots love that stuff. That is one of the best, honest to God, best ways that you can support me and support this work is, is leave a comment, leave a review, whatever. All right. That is, is actually we're done with that i'm i'm done with it so we're done now okay next class uh the 27th uh 7 p.m pacific standard time fire in the tarot okay <clears throat> look i have been going to <laughs> a lot of shows and i was out in the woods camping at a metal show for several days i it's gonna take me a second to get my rhythm back <laughs> But I am refreshed and refilled with uh, new inspirations and visions, and you all are in for it. So here we go. <laughs> um, first and foremost, let us ground into our Litha energy. What are we doing in Litha season? We are centering our work uh, in its myriad of forms around ideas of power, transformation, healing, fertility, and commitment. Um, uh, there is, as I have said in many places, many times um, throughout this season or these seasons, um, in spring, there is an experimental attitude. And in summer, we start to commit to some things. We start to claim some things. We start to own some things. We start to, um, you know, accept and take in and begin to protect, begin to nurture. That's very Cancerian. Uh, we begin to engage our leadership qualities and accept responsibility for things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's really the vibe as we move out of summer or out of spring and into summer. And litha season is the portion of that where we're moving from a very heart centric place. Again, it's over, it's overseen by cancer and cancer energy. Um, so that's, that's just to kind of ground us in the season. If you want to know what you're like, what are you talking about? Go watch the class. Um, but that's, that's the general sense of the, the backdrop of us stepping into summer and moving through litha season. Um, to a lesser extent, there's going to be an emphasis on things like fire, the sun, sexuality, whatever that means for you, the fullness of solar power, personal power, transformation, commitment, judgment, the needs of others, sacrifice and masculinity. And I'm getting all of this information out of my Litha workbook that, um, that I've created, uh, and that is available for folks who are subbed as patrons at the Venus level and higher. Um, last ad for a while, <laughs> but it is pretty helpful. <laughs> a lot of the information that we talk about in the podcast are in the book. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing with Litha season in the backdrop. So this week we are, um, working with the sun in cancer, right? We are in summer. We are in Litha. The sun is moving through cancer. And this week we have our waxing moon in Libra at four degrees. And uh, this moon is making some very wide aspects to stuff. And so I'm kind of considering the aspects that it's making to some other planets, but I'm sort of not too worried about it. But it's making a wide trine to Pluto retrograde at 29 degrees of Capricorn, a wide square to Mercury at 28 degrees of Gemini, and a wide opposition to Neptune at 27 degrees of Pisces. And so, you know, that stuff is in the mix. Um, our, our, our elements that we're going to get from those planets and those signs are in the mix. But for me, a lot of the emphasis is going to be just 
straight up on this waxing moon in Libra. Um, Cancer, the sign in the background for us is a cardinal sign. It's a kicking off sign. And Libra is also a cardinal sign. It's a kicking off sign. Um, And the mix of these two is about initiating conversations and dialogue, social networking, initiating friendships, initiating relationships, initiating emotional connections, um, initiating uh, conversations and data acquisition around nurturing and taking on projects and overseeing the, the maturation of systems and, and processes and projects. That's really what this moon is all about. But, you know, um, it, it doesn't play out as tidily as that sometimes. <laughs> uh, this moon is ruled by Venus in Leo. Venus is the ruling planet of Libra. And um, Venus is very stoked to be in Leo, can be a little full of themselves, can be a little proud, can be a little ostentatious. But you know what? We've had a hard few years. Go ahead. <laughs> Wear the sequin vest for that. Yes. Like, I think that's probably the best choice here. So, um, you know, at at its surface, the waxing moon in Libra is like, hell yeah, let's get it going. Um, it's a fantastic compliment coming off of, uh, pride weekend here in Seattle, but it's a fantastic compliment to, uh, the surging energies of pride month and pride season. I know it's pride. June is pride month, but we have pride festivals throughout the summer all across the country. Um, and so I think this is an excellent compliment to Matt to that. Um, so what are we doing with our waxing moon in Libra? We are being asked to focus on our principles. Um, and when is it appropriate to stand on our principles and when is it appropriate to compromise? Remember, this is a waxing half moon. And at the waxing half moon in our little plant metaphor that we work with every week, we are reaching a branch. There is a decision to be made. We need to, uh, you know, make some kind of adjustment to the path or we need to branch out in a new direction or some, some kind of a shift or a change is here. When we're, when we're at the waxing half, that means that the sun and moon are square to each other, which means that there's some friction. And, you know, as we've talked about before, when we are dealing with a square, many times what that square really is at its root is an opportunity for us to work on something and get better at something. We are being shown what's not working or where there's friction or where there's tension or something weird is going on and being given an opportunity to make a decision about that. What do we want to do about that tension? How do we want to deal with this friction? Um, and, you know, obviously the, the best case scenario is that we utilize it to propel the situation forward, right? To ultimately improve and become, you know, better at or to advance or to increase in some way. So, uh, so at the outset, again, this is about principles, when to stand and when to compromise. Um, and this waxing moon in Libra in particular is really about like, where is it appropriate to go against the grain, especially when it is on behalf of the outsider or the downtrodden or the quote unquote black sheep? Um, when is it appropriate for us to stand up on behalf of folks that are outcast in some way? Um, and so this is a moon that really lends itself to political action. Um, again, when, especially when we are standing up for the outsider or when we are standing up for, for the outcast individual. Um, and, you know, we don't need astrology to tell us that there's wild shit going on in our country right now for trans folks, for queer folks, um, for those of us who are queer and for those in our communities who are trans you know, it's, it's bedlam right now. It's really wild. Um, and so this is a moon that, that sits in complement to all of that, given everything that's going on. Libra is very much about harmony and community and, and, 
you know, flow amongst the people, <laughs> goodness of flowing amongst the people. So this waxing half moon is like, where is that not working? Um, and where, where are, where is society, you know, creating some kind of an outcast cast, uh, or class? Um, and what are you going to do about it? <laughs> that stuff. If all of that sounds like a lot, if all of that sounds like, uh, um, because a lot of that could end up in debating people or arguing with folks or having some kind of tense conversation, you might also just listen to or read, um, debate between two people who know what they're talking about, but have opposing viewpoints. That's another way to utilize the energy of this moon. Um, you know, there is other stuff in the world going on and it is not safe literally for some folks to physically engage in situations <laughs> where they are, um, you know, standing up against, uh, the forces that be in the world. Um, so, you know, work with this information in a way that makes sense for you. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that we are wrestling with, with this waxing moon in Libra. Okay. That's all I'm going to say about that. I'm not going to get into the planet stuff too much. You can do your own research on that. With those wide aspects, I'm like, yeah, sure, they're there. But mm, I feel like all of that is already, I, th I feel like I talked about it already, honestly. <laughs> okay. So for our lunar body work with a waxing half moon in Libra, we are awakening, activating, adorning, stimulating, or preparing for action. The hips the kidneys and the bladder, the kidneys and the bladder, of course, are in charge of filtration and sending useful stuff back into the bio systems. As I say every single week, I am not a doctor of the human corpus. I am a doctor of the cauldron and the moon and stars. Uh, so don't listen to me, some wild lady yelling on the internet about what to do with your physical health. Check in with your trusted health advisor if you're wanting to integrate any of this information. And also, whether you do or not, I always recommend working with the metaphor. So, you know, in your thinking, in the debating, are we throwing out useful information because it's coming from somebody who is opposite us in the argument or the debate? slash, um, you know, are, are people being cast out of the conversation and they need to be pulled back in, um, and they're being, you know, filtered out as, as a problem when actually, uh, they have a piece of information that is vital to the, to the process. Okay. Uh, for our plant body work, um, planting, well, we, we go back and forth, right? We, we do two different things. Sometimes when we're dealing with a Virgo moon, Libra moon, we're not doing anything with the plants, but we also have another system that says, yes, do stuff with the plants. So <laughs> if we're doing stuff with the plants, we are planting for beauty. We are planting for aesthetics only. So either you're planting stuff that's just super duper cute, or you are planting plants that you intend to use uh, for cosmetics that you intend to use for beauty, that you intend to use for self-care, that you intend to use in glamour magic. Um, wipe down your plant leaves, check lightings and decorations around plants, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, all of that. Okay. What else might we be doing? Planting flowers for beauty, uh, root crops, tiny crops, fodder crops, harvesting seeds and roots for replanting later. Yes, also, and uh, we are absolutely in the season of gathering day. Um, again, go watch the class, but uh, all throughout Litha is the most holy time of the year to be ethically harvesting our herbs, our flowers, our seeds, our what have you that we are going to be using um, for magical uh, ingredients throughout the rest of the year. Um, so yes, this is another moon that is uh, especially dedicated to harvesting. Um, also, and we are planting annuals that yield above ground crops, especially viney plants like peas, beans, melons, squash, tomatoes, peppers, cereals, grains, hay, garlic, cucumbers, 
Uh, this is a great time for taking cuttings, for grafting, and for doing um, above ground harvesting um, that is specifically for drying and for storage. Okay. Uh, and uh, thanks, shout out uh, to the patrons that I met while I was at Cascadian Midsummer a couple weeks ago. Uh, or a week ago. What is time? Uh, it was very fantastic to meet you all. My gosh, did I come home with a giant pile of gifts, including somebody who grew some plant material using my advice from here in the podcast, which was a very special full circle moment for me. So <laughs> yay, that was very cool. Okay, <laughs> moving on to uh, the astrology of Monday, June 26th, we have two fancy events going down. One, Mars in Leo, square Uranus in Taurus at 21 degrees. Now, let me say this. I obviously try not to be too prescriptive with the information that I give you here on the podcast. We're talking about a lot of theory, right? We're talking about a lot of concept, right? It's very abstract. It's very philosophical. Hello to my Sagittarius sun and stellium <laughs> in the ninth house. Uh, you know, we like to wax here uh, on the podcast, but when it comes to Mars hanging out with Uranus, I'm not screwing around. Uh, watch out, pay attention, slow down, take a breath. Mars plus Uranus equals tripping over stuff, fender benders in traffic, uh, dropping things that you need, um, weird accidents with your technology. Um, that literally, it just, it's, and especially a square, oof. Um, Mars is super impatient, wants to be there yesterday, has no time to plan things, is not concerned about like making sure the path is clear, is just going to like barrel ahead and do whatever it wants to do. That's Mars. And then Uranus is faster than the speed of light, thinks it's a bolt of lightning, uh, also a, a chaos ninja, and also is very focused on tomorrow and the next day and is very disinterested in the here and now. So the combination between these two planets equals very easily not paying attention to what is happening directly in front of you right now and thinking five minutes into the future, driving and looking five cars ahead and not paying attention to what is directly in front of your car. So my very best advice with this astrology is slow down, take a breath. If you're going someplace, leave 10 minutes early. Uh, you know, just be prepared for shenanigans. Um, double check to make sure you tied your shoes, you know, all of that type of stuff. Just, just slow down, look where you're going, watch your feet, that sort of thing. These two really like to screw it up for folks. <laughs> and again, you know me, I don't like to be super prescriptive with this stuff, but it, when it sees two planets, it's like, oh Lord. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So also on the same day, we have Mercury entering zero degrees of cancer. And if you uh, will think back in time with me, uh, Mercury entered Gemini two weeks ago. That's how fast this planet is cruising right now. Mercury is zipping through the sky so fast, like so, so fast. Um, so we have Mercury here entering Cancer. As I speak the name of the water sign, I'm going to chug some water. Um, what do we get with this? Mercury is significantly more productive, honestly. <laughs> hanging out in, in cancer than it is hanging out in its own sign in Gemini. In Gemini, it's almost like there's too much information and it can't pick. It can't focus. It, Mercury entering cancer, it cools off a little bit. It's a little more grounded. And so what you get is a combination of the intellect, the mind, right? And it's zippiness uh, with the heart. So the mind, Mercury with the heart, cancer, um, with nurturing, with sensitivity, um, 
when Mercury is rolling through Cancer, we can all become a little more nostalgic. Uh, we can have a lot of memories of stuff come back to us. We might find ourselves looking to the past to get information about the present. Um, we might be falling back on how we used to feel about things to understand what we're supposed to do about it now. And, you know, given the events that our species has been through in the last uh, uh, three, four years, that information may or may not still apply. So just be aware of when your thinking is really emotional based this month or this next two to three weeks because mercury is not going to be in cancer for very long as i said it is zipping right now it is flying through the sky um but just take a moment and think about where are memories bringing interesting information up and maybe helpful information or where are we clouded in thinking about things from a nostalgic take which often is romanticized or thinking about things from a perspective of this is how it used to feel and where does that need to be updated or does that need to be updated that might be coming up for you this week okay that is our astrology for monday june 26th yeah it took us a minute to get there but we made it <laughs> and and i appreciate you coming with me on that um, so let's briefly look at our holy days uh, for uh, Monday, June 26th. We are kicking it off with the heliacal rising of Tejat Posterior. And Tejat Posterior or Tejat Posterior is one of the stars in the constellation of Gemini. Yes, we are still moving our way through uh, the constellation of Gemini when it comes to our heliacal risings of the fixed stars. Specifically, this star is found in Castor of the, the two twins, Castor and Pollux. Um, and so for some people in some constellations, uh, in some astrological or astronomical systems, this star is called the Heel. And it is specifically the heel of the left foot of Castor. But uh, the Babylonians called this the back of the mouth of the twins. So, you know, that's just sort of an indicator of how uh, the constellations have been imagined in different ways over the millennia. Very important to remember that. Um, but ultimately, there's there's words like canal connected to this, the seed or the branch. Um, this has even been called the abused or beaten one. Interesting stuff. Um, but ultimately, uh, today, it takes the Greek meaning for the back foot, and it literally means to kind of be on the back foot. Um and with all of that information, I don't have more <laughs> information. I don't have uh, anything else to connect that to, really. Um, uh, Tejat Prior is a hybrid Arabic Latin name, meaning the underneath front. Uh, within two degrees of it on Castor's foot is Tejat Posterior, Gamorium, the underneath rear. By the by, Tahat is a better pronunciation. Posterior also goes by the names Dira and Nuhaili. So there you go. That's what we've got for our fixed star being a little on the back foot. Uh, generally speaking, our astrology is pretty chill this week. So hopefully it won't feel like that for us too much while we're making our way through our uh, work. Um, okay. So what else is going on? We have Hajj. And this is the annual Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, the holiest city for Muslims. Hajj is a mandatory religious duty for Muslims that must be carried out at least once in a lifetime by all adults who are physically and financially capable of undertaking the journey. Um, and this uh, takes place on the lead up to uh, Islamic New Year. Um, the word Hajj means pilgrimage made to the Kaaba. Uh, and of course, the Kaaba is, you know, this pretty incredible place <laughs> in Mecca. Um, the, the sight of it is absolutely beautiful. Um, learn more about your uh, Muslim friends and learn more about um, what the Hajj 
is for those folks because it really is a pretty incredible thing. And at the center of it, again, uh, the center of Mecca, the site that that people are making this pilgrimage to is the Kaaba, um, which is a stone building at the center of Islam's most important mosque. Um, and there is, in theory, potentially a rock inside, but it could be lots of stuff. <laughs> um, could be a meteor inside. Uh, we know that uh, meteors are representations of deity that have been venerated for thousands of years. So isn't a stretch that uh, Islam wouldn't also find uh, something important about a meteor. Anyways, Hajj kicking off uh, Monday, June 26th. Okay. Also on this day, we have from our Roman friends and ancestors, Vitulatio, which was an annual Thanksgiving celebrated in ancient Rome. Uh, and um, this is uh, based on the verb vitulari, which meant to chant or recite a formula with a joyful intonation and rhythm. Um, it comes on the heels of a few other festivals, the None Capertine, uh, which is dedicated to Juno Capertine, and fo following the Popofulgia, which even Romans did not know what the Popofulgia was. They just did it. <laughs> a lot of weird stuff. Um, and then ultimately, all of this stuff was eclipsed by the Ludia Polinaires, which uh, is kicking off relatively soon in the ancient world. Um, okay. What else is going on on this day? The birthday, asterisk, but the birthday of Isis Nefersis from our ancient Egyptian friends and ancestors. Um, this is Aset Nefereset in ancient Egyptian or Isis Nefereses in Greek. Uh, what this name means is Isis with the beautiful throne, Isis thrice great. So there's a, a, a Tresmegestus element about her name as Nephoresis. Um, this is probably part of a 19 day complex, or at least it was a 19 day complex when the Romans were observing it. All righty. Tuesday, June 27th. Astrology for the day is thus. Mercury in Cancer sextile the North Node in Taurus at one degree. Uh, I don't think that this is going to cause too many ruffles in anybody's, uh, you know, coattails or what have you. <laughs> I don't even know what the phrase means. I just said it. <laughs> there's, there's Mercury doing its wacky shit. Um, but again, Mercury in Cancer, uh, you know, little nostalgic, perhaps based in memories, perhaps thinking through our feelings. Sextile the North Node in Taurus. The North Node is at one degree of Taurus. It is just about wrapped up with whatever its work has been in Taurus. So this might be a really fantastic and enlightening day of memories, thinking about the last two, two and a half years of the North Node making its way through Taurus and what all has happened for you in your growth of understanding what is the North Node about? What are the nodes about? What are they for? Might be just a really great day to do some study on that stuff. Um, and, you know, it also might be a day where there's like uh, some interesting dialogue internally for you between your feelings around ideas of fate or destiny, the direction that you seem to be headed in, and um, you know, what you need to nurture, what you need to foster, what you need to take responsibility for, um, to, to help that work move along. It's a sextile. So, you know, generally speaking, all the elements are in agreement with each other and want to get the work done. They see the work that needs to get done and, and want to get it done. That's basically our astrology for that day. Cool opportunity to work with stuff. Also, fairly mellow transit. Might, you might not feel it at all. Okay. Scooching directly to our holy days for Tuesday, January 27th, uh, running from June 27th to 29th from our ancient Egyptian friends and ancestors, we have the Sed Festival. Now, the Sed Festival is 
part of a larger complex of festivals. This was also known as the Hebsed or the Feast of the Tail. This was an ancient Egyptian ceremony that celebrated the continued rule of a pharaoh, but it was within a larger complex of festivals taking place called the Beautiful Reunion. And the Beautiful Reunion was this multi-week affair that took place at the end of the ancient Egyptian year. Um, and it coincides with the rising of the Nile and eventually the Nile flooding the Nile Delta. This does not happen anymore because of the Aswan Dam. Um, but uh, in ancient Egypt, this happened about this time every year. It happens in conjunction with the heliacal rising of the fixed star Sirius. Um, and in the uh, beautiful reunion, the festival of the beautiful reunion, boats are sailed from northern Egypt all the way down the Nile to southern Egypt or up the Nile, technically, to the to the the root of the Nile and back again. And there are these stops that are made all along the way throughout the many weeks of this festival, where basically the icons and the representations of the goddess Hathor are sailed all the way down the Nile and stopped and presented at all of these other temples. And there are whole ass festivals that take place at every single one of these temples. So the said festival is one of the temple, one of the temple festivals that takes place within this larger complex of festivals. And ultimately, um, in the the um beautiful or excuse me there's there's the beautiful festival of the valley and then there is um the beautiful reunion and um th this is a, a really well documented festival if you want to learn more about it um and just reading directly from wiki's page uh, Hathor's cult image from Dendera was carried by boat to several temple sites to visit the gods of those temples. And so throughout this whole region of the year, you have all of these festivals suddenly blooming up that are dedicated to Neith or Mut or, you know, Anubis or whomever, like all these goddesses and gods are coming out of the woodwork because every one of them get their moment with Hathor as she sails down the Nile. Um, freaking cool honestly <laughs> uh the end point of the journey was the temple of horus at edfu where the hathor statue from dendera met that of horus of edfu and the two were placed together aka the beautiful reunion aka a ritual marriage and we know that ritual marriages are embedded in the symbolism from beltane through litha and into lunasa like there's ritual marriages going on all over the place. Um, on one day of the festival, these images were carried out to a shrine where primordial deities such as the sun god and the Ennead were said to be buried. The texts say that the divine couple performed offering rites for these entombed gods. Many Egyptologists regard this festival as a ritual marriage between Horus and Hathor. Um, you know, but there's conjecture about that. Like, not everybody's on the same page. Um, it may have represented the rejuvenation of the buried creator gods. I'm like, why not both? Could be all of the above, right? Um, somebody else says that it's another celebration of the return of the distant goddess, citing allusions to the temple's festival texts, to the myth of the solar eye. And yet another person, uh, Barbara Richter, argues that the festival represented all of these things. Me too. <laughs> uh, she points out that the birth of Horus and Hathor's son, Ihi, was celebrated at Dendera nine months later after the festival of the beautiful reunion, implying that Hathor's visit to Horus represented Ihi's conception, etc., etc., etc. So we're going to talk about a few other uh, ancient Egyptian festivals this week and throughout the month of June and into July. Um, and uh, many of them are ultimately connected back to this, the festival of the beautiful reunion really really cool stuff and um uh this this festival again ultimately dedicated to hathor but basically it's like an all-stars <laughs> festival it's an all-stars episode uh you know <laughs> we're gonna get we're gonna get 30 seconds of everybody that's that's in the pantheon in this festival pretty cool stuff um, this is, of course, again, I think I said this already, but ultimately leading up to Egypt, ancient Egyptian New Year. This is all taking place at the very end of the old year 
and sort of clearing space and clearing the way for the new year that's coming in. Everybody take a drink. Okay. What's next? Because we do, in fact, have a lot. Um, the day of Aestus. Oh, actually, excuse me. From June 27th to 28th, we have Waqfe al-Arafa from our Islamic friends. Uh, this is a part of the Hajj festival. This is a pilgrimage that folks take to... Um, uh, where is it? I'm so sorry. Uh, at dawn of this day, Muslim pilgrims make their way from Mina to a nearby hillside and plain called Mount Arafat or the plain of Arafat. It was from this site that the Islamic prophet gave one of his last sermons in the final year of his life. Very holy site for those folks. Okay. Also on this day, from our Roman friends and ancestors, we have the day of Aestus. Uh, Aestus is a really interesting goddess. She is literally at the personification of summer or summer heat. Um, she's mentioned by Ovid in Metamorphosis. She might even be his invention. Um, but uh, she is hanging out with a group of people or group of deities that are personifications of time, like month, year, day, century, the hours, who are the Hore, of course, and the other seasons. Um, she wears a garland of grain and wheat sheaves in her hair. Uh, and yeah, probably um, a, a redo of the Greek depiction of the Hore and the goddesses of the seasons. Um, but yes, this is a day dedicated to Aestus, the goddess and embodiment of summer heat. And uh, last but not least, on this day, Tuesday, June 27th, from our Catholic friends and ancestors, we have the Feast of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Um, Our Lady of Perpetual Help uh, is a virgin, excuse me, a version of the Virgin Mary that is about 500-ish years old, 600-ish years old, maybe a few hundred years more than that. Um, she is associated with a 15th century Byzantine icon and a reputed Marianne apparition. So a painting and perhaps a visitation from ye old VM. Okay, that's all we've got for that day. Um, honestly, that's plenty. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's out of control. Uh, it's out of control this week. Okay, um, so again, we're thinking about our litha energy in the background. We're thinking about power, responsibility, maturation, commitment to a process, um, seizing the day, right? Okay, that brings us to Wednesday, June 28th, wherein uh, we find the sun in Cancer trine Saturn retrograde in Pisces at seven degrees. Dope. Honestly, dope. Um, this energy is very productive, it's very stable, and it's very realistic. Other than the Mars square Uranus that kicks off the week, we kind of have chill or helpful astrology all week long. Goddess forbid, right? <laughs> like, holy moly. Um, so this is dope astrology, fantastic astrology for getting real about shit and getting shit done. Saturn helps us get grounded into stuff. And again, what am I, what are we talking about in Litha season? Taking on the responsibility of things, maturing into leadership roles. Um, something that I've said a bunch of times in class and in workshops and stuff this season has been that this season is about understanding and accepting the power that the universe is trying to hand you to accomplish the work that the universe is trying to hand you. <laughs> it's not just, here's a bunch of power, now go fuck off. It's, here's a bunch of power, and then here's a laundry list of stuff I need you to do with it. Um, and that's what it is anytime that we are uh, receiving some kind of assistance or agency or boon or help or luck or 
or, you know, power from the universe, from ourselves, from community, from wherever, it's not just that we wear it on our crown, like a head, like a, wear it on our head, like a crown. It's that we illuminate the room with it, right? We don't light, we don't hold up the torch to look shiny or we hold up the torch so that everybody can see. Um, and also in the process, we do look shinier. Just, we don't want to get lost in that sauce. <laughs> it's pretty easy to. So this trine between the sun and Saturn is a really cool grounding moment that brings in maturity. It brings in responsibility. It brings in practicality. It brings in stability. Um, it brings in consistency and it, it's a trine. So we're like, yes, I understand this. I know where it goes. I, I know how to utilize this. I want to work with it. Thank goodness this energy is here. Um, so very complimentary to the work that we're doing just in litha season, as well as, uh, you know, a, a check-in on the larger process of our two and a half years of hanging out with Saturn in Pisces and that whole process. Um, okay. So that's basically our astrology for Wednesday, June 27th or June 28th, excuse me, our holy days for Wednesday, June 28th kick off with the Stonewall Riots. Happy Pride, motherfuckers. Happy Pride, okay? Uh, the Stonewall Riots, that's right. Stonewall was a riot. Um, never forget that, ever. <laughs> uh, the Stonewall Riots, also known as the Stonewall Uprisings, the Stonewall Rebellion, a series of spontaneous protests by members of the gay community in response to a police raid that began in the early morning hours of June 28th, 1969 at the Stonewall Inn in the Greenwich Village neighborhood of Lower Manhattan in New York City. Uh, a lot of, you know, wonderful people uh, had spotlights shine on them momentarily uh, because of this. Um, but ultimately we can't let that rest. <laughs> that was a single match thrown on a pyre. And it is our job as the current generations to continue to assist that fire in burning away hatred and burning away bigotry and, um, and clearing the way for love and acceptance and inclusion. Um, we don't want tolerance. We don't want tolerance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me be very clear about that. We don't want tolerance. Uh, we want our seat at the table, just like everybody else has their seat at the table. Um, we want, we want the same standing as everybody else in society. That's all. Just that. Just that. <sighs> Not going to get into it. Wait, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, light a candle to a queer ancestor, uh, on this day and, uh, pour out a little vodka probably for them. <laughs> okay. Also on this day from our Catholic friends and ancestors, we have this, the feast of St. Vitus. So also, you know, burn a candle for your goth ancestors. <laughs> um, St. Vitus, also, uh, sometimes named Guy or Guido, was a Christian martyr from Sicily. His surviving hagiography is, let's be, pure, pu uh, let's be clear, pure legend, okay? <laughs> um, did this guy even exist? We don't know. Um, he's said to protect against lightning strikes, animal attacks, and oversleeping. There's that. Um but uh, he became popular um, for dancing, quote unquote. His dancing became popular and the name St. Vitus Dance was given to the neurological disorder, Seidenham's Chorea. <laughs> okay, bizarre. It also led to Vitus being considered the patron saint of dancers and entertainers in general. Um, so interesting connection there. Interesting connections to Gemini that I'm just thinking about in the background, interesting connections to the idea of leadership and stepping out on stage and all of that. But also just as an aside, um, dude was often depicted in a cauldron. Okay. Um, and, uh, was connected to dogs and, um, 
can't really get into it much more than that. <laughs> but 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 has a connection to dogs, weirdly, interestingly. Um, and that's weird and interesting because as we roll through this next month, we're going to see multiple uh, deities and entities and festivals that have something to do with dogs on the periphery. The Popofulgium that I mentioned that happened last week for ancient Roman friends and ancestors has a, has an element of dog sacrifice to it. Um, and we have the St. Vitus, the Feast of St. Vitus, Vitus, St. Vitus connected to dogs as well. Um, and other beings connected to dogs that we will talk about here in just a moment. Um, okay, so moving on. That's everything that we have for uh, Wednesday, June 28th. And that's all I'm going to give you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so moving on to June, uh, Thursday, June 29th, we have our gibbous moon in Scorpio at 23 degrees. Now, this moon does have some fairly exact aspects to it. It is square Mars in Leo at 23 degrees and square Venus in Leo at 20 degrees. It is opposed to uh, to Uranus and Taurus at 21 degrees. And there is a wide trine to Neptune and Pisces at 27 degrees. So first off, let's ground into our lunar phase. This is our gibbous moon. So this is our last phase before the full moon. Um, and we are working with a vine. We are beginning to pick up momentum in our lunar process. The, um, the gibbous phase is kind of like whatever changes and adaptations we made at the beginning of the week with the square, we're kind of committing to it and we're, we're working with it now. It's, we're seeing where it's going. Like, let's, let's, let's get it going. Let's make something happen here. Um, and so what do we do with a gibbous moon in Scorpio? Well, um, Looking through Moon Phase Astrology by Raven Caldera, one of those books that I recommend and talk about all the time, um, they're pretty solidly in the camp of shadow work. Pull up your cloak, go inward, stay hydrated, do some shadow work. Fantastic time for therapy. Fantastic time for checking in with somebody who is unbiased, who has room and space to listen to you, to assist you in doing some, you know, deep exploration. And this could be an interesting moment. It could be tough because we do right off the bat have that square from Mars and square from Venus, and they're both in Leo. And the, the tension between Scorpio and Leo um, is, you know, Leo is like, I want to be out and about and on stage and performing and loved by the masses. And Scorpio is like, I want to be feared by the masses. And I also don't want to be perceived. And I would like to hide in this dark corner. Thank you. Goodbye forever. So, <laughs> so, you know, inherently there is some tension in this moon around maybe we might be feeling some pressure to simultaneously go inward and do this shadow work and oh my god it's summer oh my god it's pride oh my god it's the weekend oh my god i got to go out and like be seen i have to go to my friend's event i have to attend this thing so sit with that first off like if you are feeling that kind of tension don't ignore it pay attention to it let yourself have a little tantrum moment if you need to um we have an opposition to tor with to Uranus as well in this combination. So if we put a lot of pressure on ourselves, there's an opportunity for us to just like wang a hard left and suddenly do something very erratic or say something very erratic. And, you know, that's fine if it's fine, but it's not if it's not, right? If we're in a situation where we have to be in charge or people are depending on us to do something specific, you know, all this fixed sign energy in the background, the moon is in Scorpio, Mars and Venus in Leo, Uranus and Taurus. It's like fixed, 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 right? Everything wants to be in a pattern and set and determined and stationary and 
predictable and <laughs> and you know uranus is like no <laughs> i don't do that so um you know so if we're putting too much pressure on ourselves we could you know so, kind of pop off suddenly with this moon but we can also work with this moon in the sense of let me go in let me have my weird moment. Maybe this is a little against the grain because, oh my God, the sun is out and it's summertime and everybody's supposed to be partying this weekend and having a great time, but I need some downtime. I need some quiet time. And me, you know, going against the grain of the group is actually the best thing that I could do for myself right now. Um, yeah, I might, you know, my buddies might be disappointed. My gal pals might be disappointed, but this is what I need to do for me. Just listen to yourself. It might be that you feel that way in the first part of the day, but not the second part of the day or vice versa. Maybe in the first part of the day, you're like, hell yeah, let's hang out. And by the time evening rolls around, you're like, absolutely not. Everybody stay away from me forever. Thank you. <laughs> so just listen to yourself on that one. Just listen to yourself. Um, and, and know that there's always going to be another Thursday night. There's always going to be another Friday night. There's always going to be another weekend. It's okay. It's okay. If we don't do this one, we'll do the next one. It's okay. Um, for our lunar body work, when we are hanging out with a waxing moon in Scorpio, we are awakening, activating, adorning, stimulating, preparing for action, the organs and the processes of pleasure, reproduction, and waste management. It's always about sex and death when we're dealing with Scorpio. So, um, zhuzhing up the junk, zhuzhing up the undercarriage. Uh, vajazzling, I think we've said before in the past, it's a holy act this week. Uh, so enjoy, um, you know, shaving some, uh, whimsical little, uh, shapes into your pubic hair. Uh, enjoy, um, you know, what have you, right? It's yours. Enjoy, do whatever you're going to do with it, but do it well. <laughs> Um, for our plant body work with our gibbous moon in Scorpio, we are planting for sturdiness and we are planting anything. <laughs> uh, this is a great moon for planting any and all types of plants. Also doing transplanting, grafting annual flowers, fruit, and veg, um, and especially grafting annual flowers, fruit, and veg that are viney, that are going to be bearing their crops above ground. Stuff like, we've mentioned this already, but I'll say it again, corn, tomatoes, watermelon, zucchini. Also, uh, as we have already said, we'll say it again, harvesting seeds and roots for replanting. This is a great for moon for watering and irrigating or checking your watering systems, checking your irrigation systems, what have you. Uh, grafting, I think I've already said that, but yes. Um, and then just because we're in the second uh, quarter of a waxing moon um, or the second quarter of the lunar process, planting annuals that yield above ground, especially our viney crops like peas, beans, melons, squash, tomatoes, peppers, cereals, grains, hay, garlic, cucumbers, uh, taking cuttings, grafting, and harvesting above ground for drying and storage. Okay. Uh, so that's our lunar stuff for that day. The other stuff that we have happening astrologically we have Venus in Leo trying Chiron in Aries at 19 degrees. And we have Mercury in Cancer trying Saturn retrograde in Pisces at seven degrees. So this Leo trying, uh, excuse me, this Venus trying Chiron uh, definitely could ramp up the emo vibes that uh, might come through uh, with the moon in Scorpio. Um, sit again, just sit with it, just hang out with it and feel into it and see what it's doing for you. Um, Generally speaking, this really assists us in um, being present for relationship stuff. Um, and either that's going to be relationship stuff that's coming up for us, maybe things that need to be processed about past relationships. Um, and or, uh, you know, if you are in a current relationship and there's something that needs to get wrangled, this is potentially going to put us into a place where we are willing to have um, some tough conversations, but stay in a loving attitude and, uh, a sensitive, um, a sensitive place basically to be kind to ourselves and be kind to the person that we're talking to, even if we're talking about something hard. Remember 
you know, the day before we've, we were still under the auspices of that sun trying to Saturn retrograde. So there is in the background here, a really nice stabilizing and mature attitude to uh, support the um, astrology of this day. So also we have Mercury and Cancer trying Saturn. So there again, we have more emphasis on this stabilizing, grounded, um, mature attitude to listening and to talking. That's exactly what Mercury is going to want to do is talk about what it's, what its mind is thinking. It's going to want to talk about its feelings, Mercury and Cancer. And it's also because of that trine from Saturn or to Saturn, more inclined to listen and, and really listen, listen, uh, from the heart and pay attention and sit still and, and be grounded. Um, really helpful astrology, really helpful astrology for any and all of our relationships, friendships, domestic partnerships, romantic stuff, sexy stuff, business partnerships, like anybody at all that we are in partnership with this kind of astrology assists us having a good, healthy, productive, loving conversation. Hooray, right? <laughs> Freaking hooray. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the holy days of June 29th. But before that, how about an ad? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, if you love this podcast, you can support this work through Patreon. Thank you a bajillion billion times. See, the, the sirens are going off even as I say it. Um, thank you so, so much to my patrons. Um, you guys don't even know. <laughs> you don't even know. Thank you so much. Uh, you can sub for as little as a dollar if you just think this podcast is dope and you want to support it. Uh, I don't run ads on the podcast um, partly because I don't want to and partly because I won't get paid even if I do. Uh, so screw them, man. Um, you can sub, as I said, for as little as a buck or $5, even if you want to just support the podcast. And this is plenty of information. But if you want even more information, um, you know, extra podcasts, extra videos, extra information about the Wheel of the Year, magical practices, tarot, etc., etc., uh, subbing at the higher levels, you get all kinds of cool free stuff. And at the even higher levels, uh, you get free readings every month with me um, to be able to integrate all of this information into your personal life based on what's going on in your natal chart and all of that other good stuff. Join and change your life forever. Or, you know, whatever. Thanks so much for the support. If you can't support financially, I completely understand because life sucks on earth right now. It's too expensive for everything. Um, tell a friend, share it on social media, uh, give it a thumbs up. If you're feeling especially hedonistic, you can leave a rating or a review. All right. That's the end of the ad. Let's get back to the podcast. Okay. Kicking off the holy days for June 29th running from June 29th to July 3rd from our Zoroastrian friends and ancestors. We have the celebration of Harvatat. Harvatat is um, a word that we find used in a bunch of different ways. Um, so it represents, um, it represents uh, a concept of wholeness or perfection but it is also the name of an Amisha Spenta associated with water, hey, cancer season, prosperity, and health. And the Amisha Spenta are a collection of seven different entities. They're kind of deities. They're kind of embodiments of concepts. And they're sort of like forces in the universe. They're pretty cool, <laughs> honestly. Um, they're certainly divine. Um, but this is one of the greater ones, um, Harvatat. And so this is a celebration that is dedicated to sort of like celebrating wholeness in your life and goodness and plenty and prosperity, but also, um, a recognition of summer and a recognition of this watery being as well. Okay. 
Also on this day, we have from our Islamic friends and ancestors, Eid al-Aha, Adha, excuse me. Um, and this Eid is the Feast of Sacrifice. This is the second and largest of the two main holidays celebrated in Islam, the other one being Eid al-Fatir. It honors the willingness of Abraham to sacrifice his son Ishmael in an act of obedience to God's command. Pretty intense stuff. Um, but this, again, is part of the celebration leading up to New Year's and a part of the Hajj and the the um, the uh, pilgrimage that takes place at this time of, well, at this time of year, this year. Um, side note of the side note, right? <laughs> uh, Islam is a religion that uses a lunar calendar. It is a strictly lunar calendar, not loony solar. Um, so every year, uh, the holidays that are dictated by lunar events move backwards by 10 to 11 days every single year. So currently, Eid al-Adha is happening here in Litha season, but it will be uh, at the end of Beltane and then through Beltane in the coming years, and then eventually Ustara season, and then eventually uh, in bulk, et cetera, et cetera. So this all is taking place in summer now, but you know, in a few years, it'll be in winter. Interesting stuff. It's really cool. Okay. Also on this day from our Egypt, ancient Egyptian friends and ancestors, we have the feast of Mut or Mut. Um, Mut, also known as Mount or Mount, was a mother goddess worshipped in ancient Egypt in the kingdom of Kush in present-day North Sudan. In Meroitic, her name was pronounced Mata. Her name means mother. Uh, Mut had many different aspects and attributes that changed and evolved greatly over the thousands of years of ancient Egyptian culture. Um, depicted with a white and red crown. Um, white crowns are certainly something that we see a lot of throughout uh, our northern hemisphere um, summertime traditions. So very interesting that she's depicted that way. They also um, were considered a primal deity associated with the primordial waters. Again, another deity connected to water from which everything in the world was born also thought to have done this through parthenogenesis. Um, so a, a self-impregnating, um, self-fertilizing, self-virilizing uh, character. Um, and again, this festival to Mut or Moot is part of that uh, festival of the beautiful reunion. So we are stopping at the temple of Mut uh, on this day to hang out and say hi. Okay. Also on this day, we have Petorysis, uh, day, which, um, or excuse me, Pet Osiris's day, which is a version of uh, Osiris um, from uh, the Hermopolis. Also, this was a name for one of the high priests of Thoth. Um, so, some stuff in there. Um, there's connections to Sekhmet, to Kanum, to Amun Re, to Hathor, etc., etc. So, that's going on here too. Yet another festival during this, or yet another temple stop during this grand festival of uh, the beautiful return. From our Hindu friends and ancestors, we have Shayani Ekadashi. Uh, Shayani Ekadashi is um, known by various other names. It is the 11th lunar day of the bright fortnight of the Hindu month of Ashada. Uh, this basically is the um, kickoff day for the four months of the rainy season, the monsoon season. And um, it is a day dedicated to Vishnu and Lakshmi. Um, it is believed that Vishnu falls asleep on this day the cause in the cosmic ocean of milk more oceanic stuff here, um, on Shisha, the cosmic serpent, Vishnu finally awakens, uh, uh, from his slumber four months later. So during that season, um, this is the Chatter Messiah, um, AKA four months and it connects, connects us to the rainy season, water, 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 right? Um, okay. From our modern Norse friends and ancestors, we have the runic new year. And, uh, I stress this because, um, this is 
modern Nordic practice. And so because it's modern Nordic practice, what I'm going to draw your attention to is a group called Nordic animism, um, which is uh, sort of the pet project of a dude named Rune Harno Rasmussen. Um, I've taken a bunch of his classes. I think he's a dope dude. I'd love to meet him in person. I think he's probably a, a hell of a great time to party with. Um, he is a an historian of religion. Um, he has a PhD, educated from the universities of Uppsala and Copenhagen. Um, and his work is basically, you know, digging up the truth around Nordic practice. Now, my practice is not centered in Nordic practice, but it's it's in there. It's informed by it to some extent. And I'm always curious for the truth. I'm, I'm definitely a, a, a person who's like, out there seeking, you know, beyond the television screen, beyond the TV shows, what was the actual story behind these people? Um, and he's one of those guys that's, that's really trying to reconstruct some stuff. Long story long, he has sort of declared 2023 to be the year of on a U N. And this is something that's getting picked up by a lot of different pagan groups around the world. This is a modern thing. Okay. And this is, and part of why I'm talking about this is because the idea of the runic new year is also a modern Nordic practice invention. Um, and so because it's a modern invention, let's talk about some modern people who are doing a modern thing with it. Uh, you can find information about the year of on uh, at nordicanimism.com uh check out that website lots of great information um dude's got cool classes etc cetera, etc cetera. but basically he is sort of saying you know as pagans we are we're not doing a good job <laughs> um being good ancestors we need to work harder to be good ancestors to the folks that are coming in the future um and some really gnarly stuff is happening on the planet under our watch. Mm -hmm. And what are we going to do about that? Uh, he compares us to um, a violent king named On who continues to sacrifice his own children, interestingly enough, <laughs> uh, to, to uh, maintain his immortality. And, and so, you know, Rune is sort of comparing us to somebody that's like that, or at least being in this in the world with those types of attitudes and decisions where um, we really are sort of devouring the world to maintain uh, a false sense of security and a false sense of um, comfort and, and, you know, and, 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 right. So just going to put that there, <laughs> just going to leave that there. Lots of stuff to go down. I'm not a devotee of this guy. I just think that he's doing some really cool stuff. Um, I don't necessarily agree with everything that he's doing, but I like that he's doing it. So I encourage you to go check out his website, check out the information that he's got on his page. Um, and, and where he's coming from, where, where he's coming up with these ideas. I think it's really cool stuff. Okay. Also on this day from our Catholic friends and ancestors, we have the feasts for St. Peter and St. Paul. We are not going to go into Peter and Paul. We talk about them plenty. They get plenty of airtime at other points of the year. They can, they can hike it, hike up a mountain for all I care. Also from our East Anglican friends and ancestors, we have herb harvesting day. So this is just yet another uh, harvesting day, you know, here on earth at this same time of year, uh, from our friends and ancestors in Santeria, we have the feast of Ogun and Ogun is a spicy character, um, a character dedicated to, or connected with gods or dogs, yet, yet another, um, character, uh, connected to dogs. Um, Ogun, uh, is a warrior and a powerful spirit of metalworking as well as rum and rum making. He is known as the God of Iron. And there's lots more to say about this deity, but um, I, I re recommend going and doing some research on this deity if there's something about them that's standing out for you. Um, warriors, hunters, blacksmiths, technologists, and drivers all sort of fall under the auspices of Ogun. 
Um, okay. And last but not least, uh, from our global collection of traditions, we have International Fisherman's Day or Fisher Person's Day. Um, this is one of many, 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 many oceanic awareness and oceanic uh, job awareness days that we have all through June and July in particular, one after another after another from the ancient world and the modern world. Um, Ocean Awareness Day, Mariner's Rights Awareness Day, International Fisherman's Day, etc., etc. Piles of during cancer season. What are the odds? I'm sure it's just a coincidence. <laughs> okay. Moving on to Friday, June 30th. This is the end of June. We are about to step into July. Um, our astrology on this day, we have Neptune stationing retrograde in Pisces at 27 degrees and Mercury conjunct the sun in Cancer at 9 degrees. So honestly, not a lot to say about either one of these things, actually. Mercury, excuse me, Neptune stationing retrograde. First off, Neptune literally spends half the year, five months in retrograde. So I don't care. Uh, <laughs> I don't care. Now, granted, I will say this. Um, the days that the planets that spend a long time in retrograde the days that those planets change direction, those are days where we can feel a little extra buzz, a little extra something. And when it comes to Neptune, we can be a little spacier, a little dopier, a little doofier. Um, we might be a little less attached to the body. So we might need to remind ourselves, hey, let's drink some water. Let's make sure we've had a snack. Did we stretch today? Did we go for our walk? You know, that kind of thing might be something that we need to pay a little extra attention to. Um, Neptune can confuse. It can, um, uh, it can make situations very hazy and indeterminate. Um, so this might be a day where we want to like, can I, you know, ask for an extra day before I sign the contract or before I answer this very complicated question, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but also can really lend itself to a daydreamy attitude, a very spiritual attitude, a very introspective attitude. So if that kind of activity is presenting itself on this day, the Neptune retrograde is here to help. Okay. Also, we have Mercury conjunct the sun in Cancer. And Mercury conjunct the sun uh, is just bringing our sense of self into alignment with our thinking, our mind and our mode of thinking. And as we talked about previously, our mode of thinking is nostalgic and memory based while Mercury is hanging out in cancer. So our sense of self is really coming into alignment with that. This might be a really great day to like go sing karaoke with friends, but all you're singing is songs from like the year you were born, <laughs> you know, or something like that where, you know, or you're, you get together with some pals and you like watch some movies from your teenagehood or your childhood or something like that. And, and sort of revel in, um, that media and that fun stuff from the past. Okay. Moving on to, our holy days from June 30th, Friday, June 30th, we start off with the heliacal rising of the fixed star Alhenna. So Alhenna, where are you? I know you're here somewhere. Yes, here we go. I only, I literally have like 87 tabs open. Don't, don't laugh at me. Okay. So the fixed star Alhenna this is also found in the constellation of Gemini, and this star is found in the left foot of Pollux. Um, the traditional name Alhenna comes from the Arabic word Alhana, which means the brand, as in like a brand on the neck of a camel. Another name was Almizan from the Arabic Almizan, which means the shining one. And that's the name that that picks perks me up a little bit there. Um, because as we move through Litha season, as we come towards Litha, like the last two weeks of Beltane season, 
on Litha or summer solstice. And then as we move through Litha season, um, deities are often depicted wearing a white hat, a white helmet, a white crown, a white veil, a white cloak. Um, they are often depicted with whiteness and brilliance around their head, shimmering or scintillating whiteness and brilliance, um, a gold that turns to white, all of that kind of stuff. So that this star is referred to as the shining one sort of pricks my ears up a little bit. And it makes me think about some of those other words that we're hearing uh, at this same time of year. But also, interestingly enough, um, it is also called the bright foot of Gemini. And according to one author, it means, quote, hurt, wounded, or afflicted, end quote. And it has been called, quote, the wound on the tendon Achilles, end quote. Um, now, that's very interesting to me because we have a Hercules festival coming up soon. In, in the next couple of weeks. So I wonder if the heliacal rising of this fixed star and that holiday weren't connected to each other at some point in the past and have wandered away from each other thanks to the precession of the equinoxes. I don't know. Just think it out loud here, kids. You know how I do uh, here on Ye Old Podcast. Um, so many incredible ideas that I have. So many really brilliant. <laughs> and humble. <laughs> okay, what else is going on on this day? Um, from June 30th to July 1st, and honestly, probably a lot longer than that, we have from our ancient Egyptian friends and ancestors, the Feast of Opet Epi. Um, Opet and Epi are two different names for the same deity. Um, and this is also an extension of the festival of the beautiful, beautiful reunion. Um, Opet or Epi is basically a grandma goddess. She's very similar to Mut, uh, in her descriptions, um, at Karnak, she was called Epet, uh, in the demotic, uh, magical papyrus. She's called Apet, the mother of fire. She is depicted as a hippopotamus. Sometimes she's depicted as a combination of a hippo, a crocodile, a human, and a lion. Uh, usually she's depicted with a lion's head, a hippo's body, human arms, and lion feet. She is seen as a protector of the pharaoh and invoked as mother. Um, and she's also seen in uh, one branch of Egyptian theology as the mother of Osiris. And she might even be a forerunner of the goddess Taweret. Um, she's a badass. I don't know how else to say that. Like, she's like, I don't want to fuck with her at all. Honestly, <laughs> like there's really no need to, to call down that kind of pain game. Um, very, very powerful deity. And, um, the Opet festival, um, again, part of, uh, or sort of in conjunction with the festival of the beautiful return. Um, and, Part of that comes from the changing nature of the route between Karnak and Luxor temples. Um, the processional route between the temples, temples varied with time, sometimes traveling by foot along the Avenue of the Sphinxes, which was a road nearly two miles long lined with statues of mythical beasts. And at other times, the sacred statue of Opet uh, traveled from Karnak to Luxor in a specially made bark or boat known in Egyptian as the Usarat Amun or the mighty prow of Amun. Uh, this vessel was built of Lebanon cedar covered with gold. Its prow and its stern were decorated with a ram's head sacred to the god. We know that there's an Amun Ra out there with a ram's head. Uh, we talk about them during Ostara season and, and Aries season. Um, and so, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, but this festival, um, ultimately was, uh, a part of the turning of the wheel of the year for those folks. Um, they looked at 
you know, each natural event as a sign or an intervention from a specific deity who wanted them to maintain the natural order of the universe or Ma'at. Um, and so to make the gods happy, Egyptians routinely made offerings to the gods, sacrifices, prayers, and festivals. Um, and in this perceived symbiotic relationship, uh, the celebrations of the gods provided assurance to Egyptians, allowing them to live their lives. So the Opet festival reestablished um, this essential communication between the gods and Egyptian society through the rebirth ceremony in the temple of Luxor. So um, again, this is sort of a pharaoh protection thing that's happening within the larger auspices of the festival of the beautiful return that's taking place over several weeks. Um, again, Opet or Ippi, um, basically the same thing. Protector of the Pharaoh, invoked as mother, etc., etc. Okay. Uh, what else? Because I know that there's more on this day. Um, oh, right. So also on this day, connected to all of this stuff, we have uh, feasts for Onofris, which is an epithet for Osiris. It means enduring in well-being or the good Osiris. Like, he's doing good. <laughs> Osiris, he's doing good. Onofris. Uh, also, Kanum, um, one of the earliest known Egyptian deities, originally the god that was the source of the Nile. And as we know, this festival is very Nile centric because we're literally sailing from one end of the Nile to the other. So festival for that dude too. And then also a festival called the burning of the widow's flame. Um, and again, all of this stuff connected to the, um, the uh, festival of the beautiful return. Um, frantically looking for my notes right now, like where I have so many windows open. <laughs> I know that it's here somewhere. There was something specific that I wanted to read. Did I close that window? Yes, I did. Da -da 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 -da. There it is. Okay. Thank you for taking that little journey with me. Uh, okay. Burning the widow's flame. First of all, that's a badass festival name. So fucking dope. Uh, this was the last day of the beautiful reunion. I'm reading directly out of my notes. This is the fourth day of the procession of Hathor, Lady of Dendera. And as you'll remember, we kicked that off uh, with the said festival on June 27th. Um, she proceeds to the royal kiosk with a great torch of dried grass. Before her, it is called the Widow's Flame returning and resting again in her temple. Um, my majesty, and this is in reference to a particular pharaoh that was alive at the time that this was written, Thutmose III, desired all the temple's business to be directed to my mother, Hethert, Lady of Thebes, on the day of the eve of her festival, which is the last day of the 11th month. So, as I said before, like all of these festivals are sort of wrapping up the end of the month and the end of the ancient Egyptian year, um, and so those last four days of the festival, the beautiful reunion are her sort of returning home and ultimately being tucked back into her festival and, or it, it backed into her temple, uh, to, you know, to sort of restore the order for the coming year. She's now met with Horus at Edfu and she is potentially pregnant with Horus the younger, whom she will give uh, birth to nine months from now. Um, but as she walks into her temple, she is um, burning this great torch of dried grass before her called the widow's flame. So dope. Okay. Egyptians, you guys, we're doing such cool shit. All right. <laughs> From our Shinto friends and ancestors, we have the festival of Nagoshi no Hare. Uh, this is a festival that is a summertime purification festival. Um, it literally is a let's kick off summertime and get it popping. Um, and this is very cool. There is a giant wreath woven out of grasses and suspended uh, with something. Sometimes it's an archway. It's almost entire. It's almost always a, a full circle. <laughs> 
participants in the ritual pass through a chinoa, a sacred grass wreath, which symbolizes purification in Japanese culture. The chief, the shrine's chief priest leads the participants through the wreath, but you can do it yourself. Simply bow, pass through the wreath, and circle back to the front from the left, pass through again to the right, then pass through again one last time. Left, right, left. You are literally drawing the infinity sign as you walk through this wreath over and over again. Like, what? <laughs> uh, so cool. The process is believed to cleanse the participants of all misdeeds, protecting them from misfortune, praying for health. The large Chinoa grass wreaths are typically set up under a shrine's Tori gate or in front of its main hall. Um, and so the weaving of this is a sacred act. Walking through it is a sacred act. And it's basically thought of as like, we're halfway through the year. So let's wipe the slate clean, reset, you know, hopefully bless ourselves from any BS that we've picked up over the last six months and get ourselves squared away for the next six months of whatever ridiculous adventures we're about to get up to. <laughs> so smart. I love it. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Last but not least on this day of uh, Friday, June 30th, we have from our Greek and, uh, ancient Greek friends and ancestors, Skidophoria. Uh, we are in the month of Skidophorion. So this is the festival for that, also known as Skira. Um, this was the month of the final harvest of the grain and thus another major agricultural festival uh, here in Skidophoria. Um, the Skire, the, in the Skire, the shaded procession to Skiron, which originally concerned Athena and her rival deity on the Acropolis co coincided with some mystical ritual of Demeter confined to female participants. Um, so Skiron was a precinct on the road to Eleusis near a sanctuary dedicated to Athena Skiris, Poseidon, Demeter, and Kor. Um, and so something was done here pertaining to the fertility of the crops. And a lot of folks think that, um, that offerings were made, that sacrifices were made and offerings were made that are ultimately dumped, uh, into, um, this temple, well, under this temple that then during Thesmophoria, which we're going to talk about in October or November this year, I think it's in October this year. Um, they would go back and pull the offerings out. They would pull out this oh fall, the, these rotted offerings, and scatter them on the fields um, in in October. And so some historians are like, maybe they made those sacrifices now here at Scarifolia because they would have to have time to rot um, and and become mulch basically by the time they were pulling it out in October. Um, this was one of the few days when the women of ancient Athens could gather in public. The women would withhold intercourse from men on the day of the Skira, eating garlic to encourage them to stay away. Uh, the festival also involved a race to a shrine of Dionysus. Um, the winner would receive a drink made of wine, honey, cheese, grain, and olive oil, all of which are fruits that Athena is asked to bless. And that brings us to Saturday, July 1st. Boom. It is officially July. Okay. The astrology for this day. We have Mercury in Cancer, sextile Jupiter in Taurus at 9 degrees, and the Sun in Cancer, sextile Jupiter in Taurus at 9 degrees. And both of these transits are freaking rad. Honestly, they're freaking great. Um, both of these transits assist us in seeing the bigger picture, doing research, um, setting goals, uh, kind of like, this is another really great day for recalibrating, checking your direction. Like, where am I headed? Where am I at? Where am I trying to get to? And am I lined up for success in that? Am I doing everything that I can, uh, to point myself in the direction that I want to be going in? Also, both of these uh, transits are really great for socializing. They're really great for networking. They're really great for socializing in like a marketing way or a business way, getting your message out to people, advertising. Yes. 
but they're also really great for socializing as in like hanging out with humans and having a nice time. <laughs> so God forbid, right? Like, yay, <laughs> let's just have fun. Uh, it's a Saturday. So freaking fantastic. Go to the park, bring a boom box, make some new friends. That's basically the vibes. Um, and also when we are uh, experiencing a sun sextile Jupiter in particular, this can be a very lucky day. Um, so this could also be a really great day to ask for help, ask for things from the universe that you think you might not get otherwise. We are, you know, at the high point of the solar mark. We have a waxing moon and now we have this sextile between the sun and Jupiter. Those are all very fortunate um, astrological aspects to assist us in getting the attention of the gods and, you know, asking for something and hopefully them not giving us the, the joke answer, but, in, but instead a nice straightforward answer. <laughs> Your mileage may vary. I'm not going to guarantee anything there. <laughs> okay. That's our astrology for July, for uh, July 1st. That's it. That's it's cool. It's good. Go hang out with people and have a nice time. There it is. <laughs> okay. So very quickly, our holy days for July 1st from our Hindu friends and ancestors from July 1st through the 6th, we have Jaya Parvati Puja. Um, Jaya Parvati Puja is a five day festival dedicated to unmarried women who are worshiping the goddess Parvati in seeking an ideal husband. Um, foods with salt are not eaten, um, but instead things like milk and ghee and fruit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but really this is dedicated to um, the, the emphasis from Brahmin women um, who, in, uh, excuse me, not Brahmin women, um, that is a, a cast in Hindu society. It's not what I'm trying to say. Uh, uh, this is a festival dedicated to women who are unmarried, who are looking for partners. And that connects us to our sacred marriage stuff that we are doing throughout Litha season. Um, as we have talked about over and over and over again, so many different sacred marriages happening at this time. Okay. From our friends and ancestors in Bulgaria, we have July morning. And I just found out about this festival and I thought it was hilarious and I had to include it. July morning is an annual Bulgarian festival celebrated on the night before and the first day of July. The festival is unique to Bulgaria, but it is not universally observed there. Um, basically, people travel, hitchhike to the Black Sea uh, to meet the first rays of the sun rising over the Black Sea. So that's very, very cool. Uh, how did all of this get started? Because of a song by a band called Uriah Heep called July Morning. <laughs> and people just were like, let's go do that. And so they did it. <laughs> um, what I loved is I read in one source uh, that people have tried to commodify it, but because people just show up and go and party anywhere on the Black Sea, they couldn't get a central location to try to commodify the festival. And so it's just this like wild feral thing that happens and like whoever shows up, shows up and wherever you decide to party, that's where the party's at. Very into this vibe. Go, go Bulgarians. Don't let them commodify your shit. <laughs> Chase them off if they try to do it. I love it. Uh, but yeah, you know, a lot. It's it only started, you know, a few decades ago, but it certainly harkens back to some pretty old stuff and some things that lots of folks are doing around the world and have been doing for a lot of a long time. So, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Okay. What else is on this day from our Roman friends and ancestors? Uh, oh, I guess I should, I should mention this. I have a, a playlist for Litha that I will be sharing with patrons shortly. And of course I had to go find the song. So it's in the playlist. <laughs> um, okay. From our Roman friends and ancestors, we have a sacrifice at one of the temples of Apollo. I couldn't figure out which one. There's far too many. There's literally so many. <laughs> that have been documented. If you're not familiar, Apollo, solar dude, solar deity, and, and also some other stuff. Um, 
the name Apollo, when you dig in on it, is actually connected to a lot of stuff. Um, a god who affords help and wards off evil, uh, also an averter of evil, but um, there's also words that mean um, like Hyperion. Um, other words that are connected to Apollo are things that mean, uh, digging through my notes, wall, a fence for animals, an assembly within the limits of the square. Um, it's also connected to the idea of uh, destroyer or redemption or purification, simple, ever shooting, uh, assembly to fold, like being a, a god of flocks and herds, the fold, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Apollo, one of those deities that started out as a god of light, a god of solar power, and eventually ended up a god of all kinds of stuff. Um, too much to say here now, but Apollo. Dun dun. Okay, cool. Um, all right, that brings us into our last day of the lunar week, Sunday, July 2nd. And our astrology for this day is just this Venus in Leo, square Uranus and Taurus at 21 degrees. So, um, where can this energy go in any direction? Because it's Uranus, it's wacky. So, worst case scenario, uh, you might pick a fight with your partner because you're looking for something new you're looking for a new different energy. And so you're just like, well, what if we had an argument? It, it could be something as dumb as that. Generally speaking though, with Venus square Uranus, we are attracted to and wanting to hang out with wanting to socialize with people that are very different from who we normally would want to date or hang out with or socialize with. Um, we might want to try something very, very new in the bedroom on this day. Um, we might want to try being with someone new in the bedroom on this day. Uh, we just want oddity. We want new, we want different. We want off the beaten track. We want to shift up the energy in our relationship stuff in one way or another. That's really what's up. Um, and if we're working with it in a, in a positive way or a heads up way, that could be really fun. Bring in something exciting, brand new, different, change up the energy. If we're not paying attention to ourselves, we might pick a fight. <laughs> so just be aware, um, you know, because we're all a bunch of goofy bastards <laughs> from time to time. <laughs> Um, okay, that's it for our astrology for uh, Sunday, July 2nd. So let's move directly to the holy days of Sunday, July 2nd. From July 2nd to July 7th, from our Roman friends and ancestors, we have Mercatus number one. We've talked about the Mercatus in past years here on the podcast. And the Mercatus are literally enforced shopping days. They come right on the heels of uh, big, long festival complexes, which, you know, we know that the Roman world was definitely influenced by the uh, Egyptian world, um, you know, or what was left of it. There was still lots of stuff happening at that time. And, um, and so all of those festivals that would have been taking place throughout the Mediterranean and down into Northern Africa, at some point, the Roman government is like, enough! <laughs> Get, get back in the market and go buy things. Get out of the damn temples. Stop, stop festivaling. <laughs> Come buy stuff. Damn it. That's literally what the Mercatus are, are enforced shopping days. <laughs> like you will come into the city and have fun and buy stuff. And so they would, they would do sporting events. They would have like open plays and musicians on the streets and like host gambling and all this stuff to like try to draw people back into the cities to come and buy things. <laughs> oh, the more things change, right? The more they stay the same. Okay. Uh, from our ancient Egyptian ancestors uh, and friends, we have the procession of Aset. Uh, in the procession of Aset, this is Isis Luminous or Webinut. Um, and this is uh, taking out in the procession of Isis Luminous, mother of God, residing in Edfu, resting in the bark sanctuary. Every kind of good thing is offered to her. And so again, this is sort of the post funk of the reunion, the, the festival of the beautiful reunion where um, 
you know, you have all of these statues and all of these pieces being taken back to their temples and put back in their places where they would normally go and, you know, everything's sort of being put to right again. Um, okay. So, uh, also on this day from our ancient Greek friends and ancestors, we have the festival of Buphonia, also known as Dipolaia. Um, and this is, uh, hang on, pulling up my notes, pulling up my notes. Okay. This was a festival held in honor of Zeus Poleus, which is Zeus of the city. Its other name, Buphonia, means ox murdering, um, and it involved the slaying of an ox for the desecration of the altar of Zeus on the Acropolis. Uh, the festival was apparently antiquated even in classical times, and this is something that we see over and over again with the Greeks and the Romans, where they were super dedicated to these rituals, but they didn't know what the ritual was for. They knew they had to do it, they knew it had to like go a certain way. They knew that like this torch had to be lit first and then they had to walk around this thing three times, but they didn't know why. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things about learning about Greco-Roman festivals and rituals was how much they were dedicated to doing it when they had no idea what they were doing. They just knew it had to be done. So anyways, long story short, Zeus, an ox, um, and the blaming of a sac of, of a murder ultimately on an ax, not an ox, an ax, <laughs> um, which is thrown into the ocean. Um, and some historians think that this festival is a marker for a shift in how, uh, altars were interacted with in ritual and how, uh, sacrifices and offerings were interacted with in ritual space. Um, so who knows, right? But interesting stuff. And last but not least for our holy days, July, Sunday, the second, we have from our modern pagan wheel of the year calendars, the feast of expectant mothers, um, the sources that I have for this claim that this is an ancient Roman holiday. Maybe it is. I have not found a trace of it yet, but that's not to say it isn't out there somewhere. Um, so for the time being, I refer to this as a holiday that we see in our modern pagan wheel of the year calendars. Um, it certainly is an appropriate time period for it. Uh, it. The Feast of Expectant Mothers being during cancer season, um, sort of the universal womb, universal mother energy that the sign of cancer carries, very appropriate. So there's nothing wrong with modern pagans placing a holiday dedicated to this idea here at this time. Completely fine and acceptable. Okay, let us very quickly roll through uh, our astrology for the week, and then we will wrap it up. Shall we? Okay. Uh, first and foremost, Monday, June 26th, 1249 AM Pacific Standard Time, later in the day for everybody else around the planet, we have a waxing half moon, four degrees of Libra. And we also have on this day, Mars in Leo, square Uranus and Taurus at 21 degrees, and Mercury entering Cancer. Uh, Tuesday, the 27th, we have Mercury in Cancer, sextile the North Node in Taurus at one degree. Wednesday, the 28th, we have the Moon entering Scorpio. We have uh, also the Sun in Cancer, trine Saturn retrograde in Pisces at seven degrees. Thursday, the 29th at 7.55 p.m. Pacific Standard Time later in the day slash the next day for everybody else around the planet. We have our Gibbous Moon at 23 degrees of Scorpio. We also have Venus in Leo, trine Chiron in Aries at 19 degrees, and Mercury in Cancer, trine Saturn retrograde in Pisces at 7 degrees. Friday, June 30th, the moon enters Sagittarius, Neptune stations retrograde in Pisces at 27 degrees, and Mercury in Cancer conjunct the sun in Cancer at 9 degrees. July 1st, Saturday, we have 
Mercury in Cancer sextile Jupiter and Taurus at nine degrees. And then a little while later, we have the Sun in Cancer sextile Jupiter and Taurus at nine degrees. And Sunday the 2nd, we have the Moon enter Capricorn and Venus in Leo square Uranus in Taurus at 21 degrees. Okay. To wrap it up, take a beverage sippy. Uh, our tarot for the week, I think we can work with the Three of Cups this week. It is connected to Mercury in Cancer. Mercury is entering Cancer this week, so let's take advantage of that. Um, but just to orient us in our tarot stuff, um, A, you can find all of this in the um, uh, Litha class and in the Litha workbook, but uh, our tarot that we're working with during Cancer season is our the High Priestess, which connects us to the Moon, the Chariot card, which connects us to the sign of Cancer, ruled by the moon and the two, three and four of cups. Those all connect to the three deacons of the sign of cancer. You can also work with the ace of cups. If you want to, you could work with the queen of cups. If you wanted to, uh, any of that is appropriate or the king of cups for that matter. Any of those are appropriate. Um, but I try to stick with those top five, the two major arcana and the three minor arcana. Three of Cups. The Three of Cups is a beautiful card that is just about getting together with your homies and celebrating life. It doesn't have to be a gigantic, huge party full of people. It's just the people that matter the most. It's the people that care about you, that you care about, that you hold closest, that are within arm's reach. Um, it's a very humble card of just, you know, very real celebration and real love and real people being with each other and enjoying. And for whatever reason, this week, when I looked at the three of cups, I really saw in my mind, three people holding their cups up to be filled by the light and the heat pouring down from the sun. I don't know, you know, I, I've been swimming in a lot of that kind of imagery lately. So, <laughs> so that's there. Um, on that note, um, patrons will be, um, uh, getting a copy of, um, my tools for Litha guided visualization that I presented at Cascadian Midsummer this year. Um, my friend Ryan Allred recorded it for me. Um, and so that video will be up, uh, shortly for patrons. Um, so check that out. Uh, speaking of letting the sun pour down and fill our cups, um, but yeah, there's the tarot that I am recommending for this week, the Three of Cups. Uh, for our witchcraft this week, uh, doing our Litha work, we are, this is, a, I think, a good week for renewing vows um, to whomever. Uh, a really great week for divination. Um, really great week for divination. Uh, a great week for gathering herbs, ethically. And a great week for political actions, especially political actions that are st asking you to step into maturity, responsibility, and um, speaking on behalf of the downtrodden or the outcast. Mm -hmm. And journaling prompts for this week, um, some stuff to think about. When is debate helpful versus when is debate a waste of time and energy? And what does this phrase bring up for you? The best way out is through. Okay, my friends, if that isn't enough witchcraft for you, I don't fucking know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> my heathens, um, I hope you are uh, enjoying this beautiful season that has come upon us. I hope you are letting the golden rays of the sun pour down over you like honey. Um, and I hope that you are filling your cup and allowing yourself to be a vessel for the power that the sun is imbuing us with, because we have a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. Uh, okay. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Um, blessed be. <laughs>